Well, thank you for the opportunity of being here with you. I was asked a few months ago if I would just come out to Sun River and share some of my experiences in Central and South American surgery with a small group. Um, I said, sure, that's easy, five minutes, I can put that together, I do it all the time. And so here we are. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask you, if you were born with this congenital defect, and you were born in a country where there was extreme poverty, where there was no one that had the ability to correct this and give you care, no facilities available, how would you get from A to C? You wouldn't. There's an area of hopelessness here in these kinds of situations. Everywhere in the world, in the third world, there are <clears throat> to that. Every five minutes, or every five seconds rather, there are uh, someone who becomes blind. Eighty percent of those are curable or preventable. One out of every thousand young men and young women, children, cannot walk properly become a, because of some birth defect. And because of cleft lip and cleft palate deformities, one out of every thousand children, and in South America it's higher, about one in every 700, for some reason that we don't understand, cannot breathe or eat or speak well because of their deformity. <clears throat> so my motivation is to help correct this problem. Mom and dad and, and a little baby with a congenital defect, uh, a cleft palate which you can't see because of the position, but nonetheless, uh, someone who really is somewhat hopeless uh, because of the situation who comes to the clinic for help. <clears throat> I asked myself uh, some questions. As a board-certified plastic surgeon, what could I possibly do to really make a difference in this whole uh, situation? And with whom should I align myself so that I can help make a difference in this? I'm reminded of a story, because of the difficulty in making these decisions, of a young girl sitting in a classroom. And she's in the back, ignoring everything that's going on in the classroom, and her teacher notices this and goes back and stands over her for a moment and says, what are you doing? She replies, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher is a little surprised, but says, you can't do that. No one knows what God looks like. The little girl looked up and said, they will in a few minutes. And so with that kind of confidence, knowing you have to just move forward with some faith, I decided to concentrate my efforts in the area of cleft lip and cleft palate. This may be a little difficult to see, but you can see the left nostril sort of spread over the top of a big defect in this little baby's upper lip. And if you look into the mouth, you'll see that there is no roof of the mouth. That's the cleft palate. You're looking right into the nostril when you look at this picture. So with that, <clears throat> with that particular uh, goal in mind, I... Uh, decided to make a few trips with some various groups. And I found that these were quite successful, but they weren't really satisfying. The children that were treated did well. They received good medical care. But there seemed to be something missing in the way that it was doing, that it was being done, the efficiency, the results that uh, could be obtained, and the money that it cost to do these particular things. I want to spend just a moment and contrast with you some of the methods that are used by some of the humanitarian uh, missions and specifically surgical missions around the world. And the most common methodology and the one that's been there the longest and is still being used most today is what's called the parachute uh, method of medicine. And that's where doctors from other countries us in particular from the United States will come into a country and kind of push aside the local medical people and 
then do as many procedures as we possibly can and then leave with no one really to follow up or care for these individuals and the best that the local people get is we'll see you next time. That didn't seem to be an adequate approach to this particular problem. Sometimes these missions are, although the individuals that are treated get great care, it certainly improves their lives, it correct, uh, create, uh, corrects the defects. I found personally that um, there's a little bit of jealousy and political nonsense going on behind the scenes, like which universities get to go, which doctors, who does the most difficult cases, how many cases do you get to do, that sort of thing. And in the end, there's sometimes some hard feelings, uh, bent egos, that sort of thing. Not that I, I don't want to criticize my colleagues because the vast majority of them are well-intentioned, they're giving their time, their effort, the very best they have. I'm simply giving you my experience and my opinion of what is happening in these volunteer missions. <clears throat> the foreign doctors, us, myself, we really have to learn as we go because when we go there most of us don't understand the language and it hurts the local medical community for us to push them aside. So rather than do that, if they're included, it's a much, much more beneficial situation for them. <clears throat> the um, other particular problem with this is that these become very expensive. It averages about $150,000 for one of these trips. That includes more than one surgeon. Uh, mine, where I usually go alone, uh, with a very small staff is, of course, much less expensive than this uh, overall. But that becomes a real problem, the amount of money that's spent and how, uh, what small percentage of it actually gets to the people in the form of medical care that they need. <clears throat> so in addition to this, as I mentioned, there's really no follow-up care under this method, and that makes it uh, very, very difficult for them. I like the uh, method that uh, the Desert International has when we all have to recognize that things have changed in the world. The thing, we no longer have a monopoly on trained medical professionals, specifically surgeons and doctors, but also nurses and others that are involved. Other countries have uh, great people that they can use and we need to utilize them. And if we do that, then <clears throat> using the local people, you can dramatically cut the costs of the surgery. They know the people. They speak the language. They understand the culture. They know about the medical care that's available. And when they understand and perform the operations, they can provide excellent follow-up care, really year-round, and they build their image and in the community and are able to increase the things that are available to the people in their own community uh, while we're gone and helping train them in these procedures. Uh, I love the opportunity of going and being able to do the right thing. Uh, a lady asked me the other night, why do you do this? And I said, because I want to be beyond the scope of the American legal and penal system. And uh, she thought I was serious, and her husband was laughing behind. Uh, but there's, there's a little bit of that. Recognize that here we have deep constraints. Uh, we're dealing with rules, guidelines, uh, protocols, suffocating regulations, all the things that go on. Uh, when you're in other areas, there's no hospitals, schedules, finances to deal with. You don't have to deal with the medical profession, the insurance companies, the, the government regulations. And also, uh, everything is, is much more available, and you actually have the ability to look at a person and say, in the time that we have available and the facilities that are within our grasp, what is the best possible thing that we can do for this person to give them the very best result? We've got the greatest medical system in the world in the United States. But to be blunt, most of the things that we have done 
are the things that are the least expensive, as demanded by insurance companies and government regulations, and also what is the safest and what is the most common. Not necessarily what's the best possible thing that could be done under these circumstances. <clears throat> so, uh, what does this mean uh, to you? Uh, with the antiquated methodology of doing parachute medicine, uh, rather than coming in and training, they spend uh, about $850 per operation, where the Desert International uh, guidelines for $850 allow us to do about 40 operations. That's because everything, all the time, the travel, the accommodations, the food, is all volunteered. Uh, no one gets paid for anything. All the management and so on is all given freely. Everything that's contributed in the form of monetary gifts all go to the patients, and they're able to have these operations done for about uh, $25 a piece. Now, I like the uh, system that was given to me uh, really as a gift from Desert International in that when I go to another country or, or a new area, a mission as we call it, uh, I'm able to select one or perhaps two, if I'm fortunate, surgeons in that area that are interested in cleft lips and cleft palates and how to approach them and how to repair them. And then when I start, I spend two or three days when I do the operations and they watch and I explain it to them. And then I help them do it. I assist them in surgery and again explain it to them and let them do it. And then the last few days, I just stand and watch and let them do it. And so by the time I have to go, they know how to do most of the routine procedures and they provide excellent follow-up care. These people in the other countries are bright, they're intelligent, they're capable, they're curious. Uh, they simply haven't had the opportunity or the means to get the education that they need in order to solve these problems. And once they get it, they're just fireballs with getting these things taken care of. Routinely what I do is go back again every uh, year or so for two or three times. They'll save some of the difficult cases, we'll do them together, and by the time I finally leave, they have their own cleft palate and uh, cleft lip team, and then I can move on uh, to another area. <clears throat> the Desert International uh, mission statement, I won't read through entirely, but just very briefly, is focusing on procedures that are relatively easily done, uh, straightforward, and can be done in pretty stark circumstances in various countries around the world. We develop and like to have in-country management. They run their own programs. Use the local professionals, as we've talked about, to elevate their position in the community and allow them to provide year-round care. Uh, working with us is easy. There's very little bureaucracy. There's very little paperwork. People love to do it. Just roll up your sleeves and go to work. We want to provide the best medical care we possibly can at the least expensive uh, cost that we are able to do. And last of all, of course, the bedrock of all of this, the foundation, is to promote, promote volunteerism, which is the only thing that makes this run at such a uh, reduced price. <clears throat> so. I'll give you a typical day in uh, a volunteer surgical mission. We leave our five-star accommodations in the morning and uh, stop by the local Taco Bell for breakfast. Uh, on the way into the hospital, consult with the neighborhood philosopher. This is Paco, and his expertise is you know, elevating Spanish... Uh, profanity to, a, to an art form. Uh, no one knows how long he's been there. He's probably 70 or 80 years old. I don't know how to tell, but even the old people remember him as always being there. Uh, we go into the little clinic that has been volunteered and provided for us. This is our little sign announcing our arrival. And of course, the, the word that's understanding 
understood in every place is gratis, which is it's free. And so we all gravitate to that. And so these people who have these problems and their children are able to come and have this done at no cost, largely because of what the local people will provide and give to them. This is our very elaborate office setting, and again, local volunteers helping with this. This is the hardest part of the whole thing for me, and that's going through and selecting the patients who are to have surgery. These people come from oftentimes great distances at you know, expensive travel, great personal sacrifice to get there. And unfortunately, when they arrive with the children that have the congenital defects, oftentimes the children are malnourished, uh, they have an illness, they've got a rash, they've got an infection, some reason why we can't proceed with the surgery. That's, that's heartbreaking to have to tell parents after all of that effort that we have to correct these problems first and have them return and do it another time. But once they're selected, then we have the introduction, of course, of anesthesia. And I put this in here because I want you, I don't know how many are familiar with a uh, operating room, uh, of course, hopefully not many, but if you look around, you'll see there really are no monitors, there's no computers, there's none of the modern things that we think of that are necessary. There's a little tank there for an anesthetic gas, there's an IV, there's a stethoscope taped to the child's uh, chest, and a blood pressure cuff. These local people with anesthesia are absolutely incredible that they're able to do the things that they do with so little uh, that they have available to them. After the surgery, uh, or during the surgery, I just put this in. If you look over our shoulder, you'll see an air conditioner. We loved that uh, and turned it on. And then they would turn it off and on and off and on and off. And, and finally we asked, why can't we have the air conditioning on? And the local superstition was that if there was any coolness or air movement during the surgery, then the patients would become ill and not do well. So we had to leave it off. And it wasn't, uh, wasn't very comfortable in that case. This next one is oftentimes difficulty with equipment. We didn't have headlights that we needed, so we liberated these from the patient's rooms these little lamps and strung the cords over our head, taped them down, and they're just lamps and you'll see if you can on the slide little towels under them so it wouldn't burn our forehead. They were great. They were better than the ones that we have here. You could see wonderfully well, but then there was a limit on time. As it warmed up, you had to take a little break. Um, <clears throat> finally, we post off. It's fun to see these children afterwards. And then I'm looking forward to a nice hot shower. Uh, you see the heat uh, attached to the shower head, a little cord to a plug that's inside the shower, spliced by duct tape. I decided I could wait a little while for a shower. They said no one had ever been electrocuted. It was hard for me to believe that. Uh, then we dine on local cuisine. We're here, we're harvesting fresh mangoes from one of the trees and just having a wonderful time. I want to give you just a short story of a young man, uh, just a little case history, and this is where it becomes tender. This little boy lived in a hut in a little village in Honduras about two days' walk through the jungle from anything that we would think of as civilization. One of the Catholic nuns knew about him, walked through the jungle two days, picked him up, came back, and stayed with him for the surgery, the recovery, and walked him home and back through the jungle real jungles with the jacarias, the real aggressive little alligators, snakes, spiders, all the insects you could possibly desire. What a wonderful thing. What, a, what, what charity. This little boy was accepted right back into the society in the village and taken in as a friend and as far as I know now is doing very, very well. Uh, <clears throat> I think we all need a reality check once in a while in our life. I like the thing that Mark Twain said when he said, there's nothing as exhilarating as being shot at and missed. And to that I would like to add that there's nothing uh, quite as tender and touching as being able to see great need, even hopelessness, and having uh, the means and the ability to give someone something that they simply cannot repay. It's a great gift uh, to all of us. Of all the 
plaques and awards and diplomas and certificates that I have, uh, many not earned, uh, just gifts, uh, this is the one that I, I think is at the top of my list, which is a gift from the children in that area uh, where they signed uh, their names or their parents did. I would, uh, even after very careful planning, some people aren't happy and they kind of express their attitude about our care, but I would like to close uh, with the story of the starfish thrower. And I think most of you have heard that. If not, simply that there was a great storm at sea. A little boy the next day was throwing the starfish back into the sea. The, uh, a man came around with him and saw him and said, what are you doing? Look at this beach. You, you can't save all of these starfish. You can't possibly even make a difference. And he picked up a starfish, threw it out in the ocean, and then turned back to the man and said, it makes a difference to that one. And so I would submit to you, these are five young boys that I had an opportunity to treat in a uh, montage here uh, that my wife did before their surgery with their cleft lips. And this is one year later, uh, how they look when it's repaired. Although we can't do everything for everyone, I submit to you that for these young men, it really does make a difference. Thank you for your interest in this.